spirit to be able to receive from God. And it does something else. It makes the devil mad and confuses him. You know, so I like, I like both aspects of that, don't you? And so thank you, Rudy, Manny, and Sanford for coming to the ark. Watch and pray. That's what we call our services here on Wednesday nights. And we put this together because we believe that we're in a season and a time that's unprecedented. You are actually seeing and have seen and will see more things come to pass in this season that we're in right now, especially over the next 18 months, more than most people have seen in their whole life of generations past. Let's pray. Father, we open up your word tonight. We open up our hearts. And I pray that as we look into your word, that we would see the God of the word, the God who weaved all these things together so that we could come to this day and this age with confidence. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your word is truth. Bless it now, we pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now remember, you're on your study guides there. You have uh, my text number. You can text me anytime during this. When a question comes up and you go, that didn't really make much sense, I, uh, I'll try to explain it at the end. We'll take all the text questions first, and then we do have a time for you to be able to answer right here live that people don't get to see that find us on our website at thearcredlands.com. And uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight, and it's an exciting night. This is one of the more exciting portions of prophecy sharing that I'm sharing with you since we started this the first of the year. Why do I say that? Because it's one of my favorite subjects. It's God and time. As a matter of fact, I'm calling it God's prophetic time clock. Now, if you look at the time clock that's up there, that time clock is actually taken from the secular world. That's one of the time clocks that they use, and they call their time clock the doomsday clock. Now, I think that's bad. I think one of the things it does is it sets us up to always worry about the future in a negative connotation. If we had time tonight, I'd take you through all the scriptures where Paul says, encourage one another as you see this approaching. Jesus said it. And he said, as you see the day, all that, look up for your redemption. It draws nigh. Oh, I love that stuff, don't you? And Peter said this, I don't want you to be ignorant. But I want you to stimulate one another onto wholesome thinking all the more as you see the day approach. That's what we're supposed to do when we gather these informations and these insights about God's Word. Tonight, we're going to jump right into it. If you got your guidebooks with you, we're going into Daniel. Here's where we're going for, for the future here, unless God changes some of it. We're going to go through Daniel tonight. Next week, we're going to be in Matthew 24, the teachings of Jesus. That chapter is filled with the evidence of where things are going to come to pass, how they're going to happen from Jesus' own words. Then we're going to look at a little bit of an Ezekiel. Then we will, somewhere out there in the future, get to that book called Revelation. Yeah, you know what? It's not the only prophecy book in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you haven't heard this, 27% of all Scripture is prophecy. Powerful, isn't it? Are you in Daniel chapter 2? Daniel chapter 2, I'm doing a little trick here with you on Daniel chapter 2. We're starting at the end. It has something to do with our subject matter of God and prophetic time clock Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 in the time of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed Ooh, that's pretty good news isn't it nor will it be left to another people it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure for ever by the way verse 45 says this is the meaning of the vision of the rock 
oh, okay. So this was a vision. Who's speaking here? It's Daniel the prophet. What is he talking about here? He's talking about there's going to be a day here on earth. God is going to set up his kingdom and he's going to take out all the other kingdoms of the world. And his kingdom that he sets up won't be a temporary kingdom. It will be a kingdom forever. That's your future as a believer in Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound like a pretty good future? Now, what's the what happened? Do you ever like where in the TV shows where they say you see the end and all of a sudden says, now let's go back a couple weeks and see what brought us to this end. What brought us to this kingdom that will never end? Well, there was a vision given to the king of Babylon and he didn't know who could interpret it and they found out that Daniel had this gift. As a matter of fact, God learned and loved to speak through those that will listen, and Daniel was one of those that would listen. You go back all the way to verse 36, and we're not going to take time to read it, but there in your notes in verse 36 through 43, you're going to see the vision was about this, this man. Have you ever had a vision about people and you go, that just was so weird. What was I watching before I went to bed? This was really strange. You have people that, that seem like they're, they're not really real. Well, that's kind of what this vision was that took place here. And Daniel describes what's happening in the vision. He says there's a head of gold. Then there's arms and chest of silver. There's a belly and a thigh of bronze. There's legs of iron and feet partly iron mixed with clay. Now, what is all that about? This next picture will show you it was a picture of this man and that Daniel was describing, and this is what he did in those verses, described who are these. He actually says the head of gold is Babylon. Isn't that pretty interesting? He's hearing about himself. As the king's hearing this this vision interpreted, he says, you're the head of gold. It's the empire of Babylon. And what God reveals to Daniel is that there are several more civilizations that's going to come. And how interesting. Catch this as as you're going to write down who the civilizations are. The head of gold is Babylon. The arms and the chests of silver are the Medes and the Persians. They are the ones that actually take over the world. They overthrow Babylon. Now, when Daniel's saying this, no one knows how this has all come to pass. But what God does, he reveals the end from the beginning. That this is actually how history plays out. That in itself, shouldn't that be? grab someone that says how do you how can you trust God and how can you trust that it really is going to work out this way now I want you to know on some of the things that I share with you there's sometimes I share this is my conjecture by what I'm seeing that was last week with the United States there's not enough scripture out there to fully remember we asked in the question and answer time and Henry said when I said it could be in the United States Henry goes it could be Pompeii you know and I went Henry, you could be right. We're, we're just conjecturing here that, yes, there's certain scenarios that fit in, and since our subject last week was the United States and prophecy, I showed you how the United States could fit into that. Okay, So we can't go around and say verbatim from last week that the United States is the new Babylon. But a lot of the things point to that's one of the possibilities. Now, tonight's message is a little different. Tonight's message, I'm really going to try to show you how accurate, when God wants to reveal how accurate He really becomes. Here's the vision that He lets Daniel interpret. And the Babylon society is going to fall, and the Medes and the Persians are going to take over. After the Medes and the Persians, Alexander the Great is going to take over the world. He's going to take over and capture everything all before. He dies at 32. So, man, was this guy ambitious or what? And that's the Greece empire. That's what you see. The Greece empire represents the belly of the thighs that are bronze. And then the leg of irons. What comes next after Greece? It's Rome. And after Rome... Here's where the conjecture small part of it's in. 
is that many believe that because it also has a mixture of iron, and iron was Rome, their empire, so there's Rome in it, and it's mixed with clay. That's where many call it Rome number two. The coming together again of the European and the Asian part of the world where former Rome used to rule, that there will be coming a coming together once again of a European country there that will all that was shattered the ten toes okay shows that Rome was split up and this big rock comes and crushes those toes and we know from this that the rock is Jesus isn't that good all right so now we can look through history this is not conjecture this actually took place and it's foretold hundreds of years before even someone like Alexander is born that this is the process of what's going to happen that's pretty powerful don't you think that leads me to in this prophetic time and God how does it all fit together remember I shared with you I'm not just here to give you information I'm here to teach you how to study God's word and in this subject of prophecy and the prophetic clock, you can't study God's words properly unless you know the nature of God. And tonight with the prophetic clock, you not only need to know the nature of God, but on the next slide, you need to know the nature of God and time. Now I put several things up there. The nature of God is this. He's not just simply one that says, you know, I got a lot of time on my hands. Okay, he's beyond time, right? He lives outside of the restrictions of time. He lives in eternity. As a matter of fact, he's the one that created time itself. And here's the third part of this that's so important. This is part of the nature of God, and it's also part that he brings into the nature aspect of time. You, the, the uniqueness of God is a personal imprint or a fingerprint. How, what is that? What could that actually be? Hmm. God has a fingerprint that he can actually do what he just did in Daniel chapter 2, spell out something that's going to happen over hundreds of years, and it comes to pass that we have the Babylonian captivity, we have the Medes and the Persians, we have the, the Greece empire, and we have the Roman empire, and the Roman empire breaks up, and, and now all of a sudden we're seeing in our own eyes I was in Portugal in 2001 when the Portuguese were still using their Portuguese dollar. It was great. I was there in August of 2001, and my American dollar gave me four Portuguese dollar. If I would have went back the next summer, my dollar was less valued than their new euro dollar. What happened? This little country of Portugal joined a European common market and they put their currency together. Is this iron mixing with clay? Well, interesting. I wonder if as they were living through those hundreds and hundreds of years, as actually they saw it would be this Nebuchadnezzar, his grandson, that would see the fall of the Babylonian Babylonian. Uh, empire as the Medes and the Persians would come in and they would take over it without really even shooting a shot it's great history to read amazing God did something his fingerprint was that he was showing I know the end from the beginning interesting aspect here's the scripture that says that that is true Keep your, keep your place in Daniel, because Daniel's where we're at most of tonight. But in Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah chapter 46, it's my favorite verse of the whole book of Isaiah. As a matter of fact, the whole passage in here, I love God's attitude. Now, I only have verse 10, uh, uh, verse 10 up there for you. But I love verse 8 and 9. If you're there in your Bible and you, if you don't have one, look over at your neighbor and watch what he says in verse 8 and 9. Remember this. Fix this in your mind. Take it to your heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there's no other. 
I am God, and there's none like me. That, that's the preface. This is what God's saying. There's nobody like me. Now watch what he does. He reveals his fingerprint right here. God in time. We're talking about prophetic clock. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. From before Babylonian captivity, uh, Babylonian empires go to fall, he's telling you who's going to take captive those, those empires and move into the next, all through a vision. Isn't that amazing? From ancient times to what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Wow, that's a pretty awesome God, isn't it? You say, how do you know that's really God? Well, there, you need to know some things first that we're just learning in today's science world. Some of the things I'm going to share with you right now puts together the pieces of the puzzle for you. Now, I know for some, we're going to venture in a place where you go, I've never heard these things before. And how do you know these? It's not because I'm all knowledgeable and all the rest. It's because God is revealing today how much more that he wants you today to know that he's the God that's over all of time. As we see these signs and wonders that are coming, it's very important that you need to know nothing's taking God by surprise. Nothing's sneaking up on him. Here's this portion that I want to teach you that let me work through it and I'll then connect the dots for you like I'm saying on Sundays. Here's where we're going to go to. First, time is not uniform. Now, this is a new concept for many people. Most of you believe time is linear. You draw a line. Okay? Let's come over to the chalkboard here. Most of you believe time is like this. Here's the beginning. Here's the present. Here's the future. And we know this part. We've experienced that part. We can't know that part. We say time is linear. That's old science. Time is not uniformed. What are you saying, Pastor? Something affects time. Here's the things that makes time vary. Mass will change time. Oh, isn't that amazing? What? Mass can change? Time can change? Yes. Acceleration or speed can change time. Gravity can change time. Now, you go, Pastor, where are you getting all this? I'm just telling you what they figured out some years ago that most scientists don't ever bring into your knowledge today for one spe particular reason. It really messes with their evolution. Because they want you to believe something's billions and billions and billions of years old. They don't want you to know time is not uniform. It's not linear. It's not here's the beginning, here's the present, here's the future. Things change time. Now, Write down this. The, the next little thing is there's an atomic clock. The atomic clock, have you, have you read about it? It keeps time for a million years without losing a second. Whoa! There's one in Boulder, Colorado. There's another made up by the government of Great Britain, or the UK, however you want to call them today, that they have one exactly like the one in Boulder. We'll not lose time in a million years, not one second. But there is a problem. Every year, the clock in Boulder is five seconds different at the end of the year than the clock in Great Britain. Now, what the stink? How does that happen? Who messed up? One of these clocks has to be defective. No, what scientists found out that time varies according to elevation. The one in Boulder is over 5,000 feet in the air elevation, and the one in Great Britain is at 80 feet of sea level. So because of the difference in gravitational pull from 5,000 feet to 80 feet above sea level, time has changed. Plus, the Earth is different because you've traveled some there, and remember, there are certain things that change time, makes the variation. It's the gravity, the mass. The mass is different in Great Britain than it is in 
boulder. Gravity, mass, and acceleration. How interesting. Now, what is that saying to you? What's that saying to you and me? Here's what it's saying. Einstein learned this, and he taught it years ago, and many of us didn't know what he learned when he found this, that we live in a four-dimensional world. You know the three dimensions. Let's see if you can get them in, in the order that I know them. All right. How did I write the order down? Because you could say them any, any which way. I wrote it down. Height, length, and width. Length and width. All right. They're the, four, the three dimensions, you know. The fourth dimension is a combination of two things. Space and time. Space and time. Now... Here's what's really interesting. Since we now know that time is not uniformed, it is not on a linear, guess how the evolutions come up with their billions upon billions of years? They take a linear line from the Earth and go to the outer parts of the universe. And they keep time constant. And they say, as you measure time from the Earth to the outermost of the universe, you come up with billions upon billions of years. That's how old the Earth is. Why doesn't anybody, now if you get the, the s s created in six days, some of the scientists in there go, uh, they're using an antiquated, you know, calculation that time is linear. And we quit understanding time is linear a long time ago. As a matter of fact, we have a couple here tonight. They are time travelers. Yes, in this congregation. You see, it was just a short time ago. They were like 14 to 16 hours ahead of us. They were living tomorrow when we were here. And you know what happened? They gained that time what happened? Acceleration. They could fly faster than the rotation of the earth and the movement of the earth around the sun that they gained their many hours back. They're time travelers. They're here in our congregation. Don't let anybody, you may get scared by them. They were in Guam. If you want to know, look, see if anybody on your Facebook has been in Guam. They are the space time travelers among us. Don't you love that? Now you're saying, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, I figured that out. If I travel from California to Philadelphia, I gain three hours. If I travel back, I lose. I gain three hours back. I flew faster than how time is happening. Now, to help you with this, I love this. Remember, God knows, he says he knows the end from the beginning all right you know why because god lives in the big e eternity outside of time so to look at time in an unlinear manner time can actually einstein time can bend that's why we can gain time and lose time that's why a Atomic clock in Boulder would be different than an atomic clock in England, even though they don't lose time by themselves. Time is different in that. See, God can see the beginning because he's outside of it. He can see the present because he's outside of it. And he can see the future because he's outside of it. From his perspective, he can see everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Are you starting to catch that all of a sudden our Bible is very scientific? It all of a sudden has a prophetic word that God could send someone to give a word to a human being that they would write down that God has given a precise equation of what's going to take place that this this empire is going to disappear. This one's going to come next. This one's going to come next. This one's going to come next. And there's a futuristic one coming. Now, he got four out of the five so far. Do you think there's one that's coming that could be a reuniting since we're already, since 2002, have seen the signs of a European comic market coming together? Hmm. Could God be five for five since he was four for four? 
Very interesting. Now watch this. Here's, a, here's another one. For, and, and now, why do evolutionists that, that want to believe that we've evolved over millions of years, and they don't want to take the Bible that says, no, if we evolved over millions of years, it means death came into the world before Adam died. And our Bible says death wasn't there till Adam sinned. And that brought death in the world. And we can trace Adam back to only being 6,000 years on the planet. His lineage goes back only 6,000 years. But they say they found dead things way before that. So either God's lying that, that things died before that and he just didn't want to tell us about it because he knew it would upset us. But if, if that's true, then he didn't really need to send his son to save us from death. Okay? But now watch this. Again, the scientists that are evolutionists, they don't want God in time to be correct because then they're answerable to a God, not to themselves. Here's what, how many grew up watching Lost in Space? All right. What was the star that they were trying to find that they knew there could be a planet in that system? It was the closest star to us. It's a real star name. Alpha Centauri. Yeah, it's the closest star to us beyond our own star. All right. This is what scientists that understand that time is, varies with mass, gravity, and speed. Here on the planet Earth, there's two twin brothers that happen to be astronauts. Okay? But one didn't do that good in math, and he has a desk job here. The other one gets to be the first to travel by space from Earth to Alpha Centauri. Now, he has to travel by light speed to make it all the way there and back in a nine-year period. He has to travel at light speed. Here's what scientists know, and NASA knows this, that while this brother is traveling, this brother on Earth aged the nine years. But because of the variance in time, when speed is added to it, this brother that did the trip only added 33 days to his life. Is that cool or what? What happened? There's a variance because God is over time. And when you add elements... Now, if, if time has these elements of variance, our God is all-powerful. Is He limited by time if He lives outside it? If He can act faster than the speed of light since he created life, he probably can act faster than the speed of light since he created something. Correct? Is it that difficult to think that he could create the world in six human days? Some of the great theologians say, if you really know God, he could do it in six seconds. He chose to do six days because he was setting up a week where you work six days and you rest on the seventh. That nothing is too difficult for our God. So you see now why the prophetic clock is so important that you know who God is and you know what time is. So when we talk about biblical prophecy and the biblical clock, realize this, God's in charge of all that time. To Him, He's got all the time in the world, doesn't He? Now, Watch how you put these things together. This tells me something. If this God that's outside of time wanted to send a message to those that were inside of time, go to the next slide. Here's the question. How does God authenticate, make it real, that his message from outside, way out here, you know, I'm in, I'm in eternity, how does he authentic make it a thought, a, a thought, yeah, make it real? A phonic, uh, I can't get that word out now. That's what happens when you grow up with dyslexia. Some words get, yeah. He makes it so real <laughs> that what's he do? He brings biblical prophecy so that human beings go, well, wait a minute, God recorded this way back here and it came to pass 
like God said it would. The authentication of of his word, of who he is. Yes, I can't get it now, right? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, look at authentic. Thank you. That's what happens. The brain freezes up on it. Thank God God doesn't freeze up on it. Well, maybe that was the 400 years of silence. No, no, okay. Uh, The biblical prophecy is the answer that God is sending a message to human beings that said, I don't know if I'll believe this. Unless they see a word. Now watch this. Go to the next slide. This is part of what he did. So he brings in the Bible. What's the Bible? 66 books. Written over 2,000 years by 40 different authors. Filled with a complete story of creation, sin, redemption, and restoration. Now, I would challenge any of my evolutionary friends out there. You find 40 authors today that have a different lifespan. Some are teenagers, some are young adults, some are middle-aged adults, some are getting in their prime, and some are the senior adults. You find all those age groups today, give them a subject matter and see if they could write separately without talking to each other and come up with a subject matter that would make sense from the very beginning, a creation, to now everybody's with this God for eternity in a kingdom. Amazing. Over 2,000 years, 66 books, 40 authors, God again, through prophecy, shows that he knows how, through time, to weave the men's hearts to bring together a book that is the long-lasting book that says, we have a time clock, and guess who wound it? It wasn't an evolutionary wind. It wasn't a big bang. I love the the Big Bang Theory where an explosion caused everything come into being, and yet, has anybody been able to duplicate that where you can blow up something and have order from a blow up? Some science is really funny, isn't it? All right, so here's what he did. Here's the authenticity. I love that part of the word. I'll change it a little bit. The authenticity of this book and a God that that created time and knew the time would vary and that he could manipulate time and he could do whatever he wanted to in time. Here's three things that you and I need to know and that we need to tell our friends that don't understand the God that we serve. Here's the first thing that you need to know. He gave us a message, a possession of a message that is powerful and it's in this, it's between these covers. 27% what's written in here is not just historical, it's futuristic. He wrote it before it would come to pass. Hundreds of years before he would send his son, it tells about a virgin giving birth. And it describes in detail how this one would grow up, that he would grow up in a remote town called Nazareth, though he would be born in Bethlehem. Just those two things, written hundreds of years before, they say that you have a greater chance to win the lotto ten times in your lifetime than for those two things to come to pass, written hundreds of years before. And there's so much more. It tells exactly how he'll die, that he'll die a death where his hands will be pierced and and that he will be crowned with thorns. and, And it tells all these things, and it even tells of his resurrection before it comes to pass. Amazing. So we know those prophecies have come to pass. Now watch, the second statement is this. Not only do we have this integrated message system called the Bible, but we have a detailed structure deliberately skillfully designed to give you that you could know something way before it comes to pass now whether or not you're smart enough to realize it many religious people were not you're going to see such an evidence in just about five minutes i'm going to share it with you the third thing is that he again structured the things in this little book with a fingerprint I love this. The fingerprint of God, the details that he would put in there that would say, ooh, someone knew the end from the 
beginning. He's God. Now, in some ways, let me give you one little crude illustration that you might get. And, and uh, Chuck Missler is the one that put the time thing that we're going to look at in just a second on there. But uh, he gave this illustration that stuck in my mind. He said, you know, if you're sitting at the Rose Parade and you're at the front where it's coming by, you're watching float after float, you don't know how much longer, you don't know how many floats are still to come. You're seeing it in the present. It's coming by where you're at. But a helicopter could see the beginning of it, and it can see the end of it. Why? Because it is a, a different perspective. Our God has that different perspective on everything. Not just some things. He has it on everything. He has it on life. He has it on death. Why? Because he lives outside of time. I thought that was really a cool il illustration that he gave. Well, we pick up the story again back in Daniel. Because remember, Daniel is a prophecy that has to deal with the time clock. We see already that he knew civilizations were going to come and civilizations were to go, and he describes them to the T in Daniel chapter 2. Read Daniel 2. We don't have time tonight to take all the reading of that because I had to get to Daniel 9 so I could show you that it wasn't the only time God spoke to Daniel that way. Because some people go, well, he was lucky. It was a, it was a one-time shot. You know, that's kind of how it happens. He got it, and, and, and did this ever happen to Daniel again? Well, my goodness, it did. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. By the way, there's more in chapter 7, there's more in chapter 8, and oh, there's another vision in chapter 12. We're only getting to chapter 9 tonight, okay? Because I want you to be able to follow along. In chapter 9, verses 20 through 24, listen to, this is Daniel speaking as we pick it up in verse 20. Why I was speaking and praying, confessing my sins and the sins of the people of Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, ooh, look who shows up, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the early vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. By the way, if, if you do not know, and, and you found us on the, the, our website and the internet here, Gabriel is the messenger of God. He's an angel, okay? He's not a man. He's an angel. Verse 23, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you. You are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and, the, and understand the vision. The angel's saying, I'm going to tell you some things. I want you to consider this message and understand this vision. All right? Then he goes on to say this in verse 24. Seventy-seven. Seventy-sevens. That's 490 years is what he's trying to say. Are, are decreed for your people and your holy city. Now watch... He's going to line out some things. To finish the transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right. We stop right there first. We're going to come back to it. We're going to pick it up. In verse 24, we see that he gives this time frame that in 490 years, there's something that's going to take place. There's going to be a decree. Do you hear that? Someone's going to decree that the people in the holy city, something's going to take place. There's going to be a rebuilding of Jerusalem. What's happened to Jerusalem? They've been under captivity. Babylon took over Israel. The Medes and the Persians took over. Israel did not have freedom to be Israel. Everybody that came in, they, they kind of messed with Jerusalem and, and Israel and all the rest of the stuff. And here Daniel, as he's praying for who? He's praying for the sins of this people and for the holy hill. He's praying for Jerusalem. Gabriel comes, God's heard your prayers, and i got some things to tell you. And he's going to tell him a six-goal prophecy. Six-goal prophecy. You have the six-goal prophecy there in your notes. I put it down for you because I knew you didn't want to take time to write about it. You want to be able to listen because I've been listening to some of you. You didn't want to write so much on Wednesday night. So here's what actually the verse that we just read. Here's the six goals. To finish the transgression, 
to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for wickedness, or in parentheses, if you want to know the actual Hebrew Greek word, is iniquity. To make an atonement for wickedness or iniquity. By the way, those first three goals were all completed through Jesus' death and resurrection. To finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, and to make an atonement. Jesus fulfills those in his first coming. The next three goals are not fulfilled yet. We don't live in an everlasting righteousness yet. But there will be a time when Jesus comes to bring everlasting righteousness. There will be a time when there's going to be the seal up of vision and prophecy. In other words, there will be no more need for prophecy. There will be a time for that. It's not right now. We're still in a prophetic time. We have a prophetic future. Okay? The clock is still ticking in that way. And there will be a time when to anoint the most holy place once again. Those three things are in our future. Will you and I see it in our lifetime? I don't know. But I know this. The first three came to pass with great precision. And we're going to talk about it in a moment, but you've got to look at the next verse in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. This is a cool one. I love this verse. Know and understand this. This is Gabriel talking, by the way. From the issuing of the decree to what? To restore and rebuild Jerusalem. I would say Gabriel is being very specific here of a future event when you say that someone's going to give a decree for your people to get your homeland and restore and rebuild your capital, Jerusalem. And then watch, from something, okay, did you see the word from there? Know and understand this. From this point, circle the word from, and then watch after rebuild Jerusalem, circle the word until. So you now are seeing a time period. It's going to be from something until something else. Isn't that, isn't that pretty obvious what the scripture is saying? From the issuing of a decree to restore until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with a street and a trench, but in times of trouble. All right. Here's the chart that you have on your back. This is the chart. In May, March 14th, 445 B.C., there was a decree by a king that allowed Jerusalem, the decree was that Jerusalem would be able to start to be built once again. All right? The 70 times 7 is a prophetic clock. 69 times 7 weeks, or the weeks represent years here. And... We don't have time tonight. You can ask it in the questions afterwards. I don't have time to explain. In Hebrew, they understood very simply that there, a week can mean a week. A week can be a week of months, and it can be a week of years. This, in the Hebrew, spells it out very clear. This is a week of years. So there's 69 weeks of years. If you time that all out on yours, you could see that that actually came out to 173,880 years. Days. I want you to see now. This is Chuck Missler's uh, timeline. If you wanted to look this up, if you look him up in timeline, he will speak for four hours on this subject. What he's speaking on in four hours, I'm giving you in less than four minutes, because that's my job. Because the four hours was very tedious and it was very good, very insightful, and all the rest. But most of it would be above my pay grade. All right. So if it's above mine, it'd be tough for you too. So here's what I'm trying to show you by this simple thing. The first 69 weeks have already come to pass. There's 69 weeks of years. The, yes, it's a little confusing. It was that many years. Do you see the amount of years on there? Amazing. It comes up to the hundreds of thousands, 173,000 days. From the time the decree came, went out to Jesus' triumphal entry on April 6, 32 AD, 
is the exact amount of days. Now remember it said, from the time the decree went out until the anointed one was going to come and be declared as king. There would be 69 weeks of years. Not within the week, not within the year, but to the day from the decree of the king to Jesus' triumphal entry. Now, for some of you go, okay, so what does that mean? Think about Jesus' life. How many times did the people wanted to declare him king? When he fed the 5,000, they said, whoa, what a good deal is this? This guy could take some kids' lunch and feed 5,000. Let's declare him king. And he said, it's not my time. When he healed them and all the rest, they said, let's, as a matter of fact, one time they said they were going to force him to be king, and he, and he got away from them. He said, it's not my day. Now, if you were to take the scriptures and look up this portion in Luke, this is a very powerful, in Luke chapter 17 through 21, as you read all this that's taken place, as it comes up to the triumphal entry, Jesus says to his disciples, it's time, go get a donkey. There'll be a room that's be waiting, and we're going to have dinner in that room. And I'm going to ride in on this donkey in the style that would say to all the people, the king has arrived. We celebrate that as Palm Sunday. Now, if, you, if we had time tonight to go through the scriptures, what the scriptures say, the Pharisees, the religious man, got mad, and they even came to Jesus. They said, we understand the crowd doing this, yelling, son of David, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that they're declaring you the Messiah and the King, but you shouldn't let your disciples come along with this folly. And Jesus says this, if they don't shout it out, the rocks will. You guys should have known this day. Because the decree went out 173,800 and what is it, 30 days or whatever it is, 880 days. It went out, you should have known, this is the day. Why do you not know this? They weren't listening to the message that was given by their own prophet that many 400 plus years earlier to their prophet Daniel that the decree would come and then this many days later the king would be recognized. And Jesus chose that day. A simple carpenter, not raised up in the synagogue, but he is the son of God, and he knows his God, his father's timetable, and he came on that day. Isn't that worth really just praising God right there? Isn't that really powerful? Oh, that was a weak praising God there on that one, I tell you. Let me tell you, uh, when I read this, as a matter of fact, uh, another author, Mark Hitchcock, he says this. He says, this one event by itself has brought many people to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that something told in prophecy and could be that exact to the day. Now, what's happening here? It said that it would be 490 years. We only had 69 uh, weeks of years, not 70. Well, we got to go back to the scriptures here, verses 26 and 27. Go back. I know this part may be a little confusing for some of you. I'll try to make it simplistic. Again, I'm shortening something that takes hours for, to minutes. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end will come like a flood. If you notice, like a flood, not a flood, but like one. War will continue until the end, and desolation, and the desolation have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many, ooh, for one seven. That one seven is a seven-year period. In the middle of that seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. All right, here's uh, Chuck Missler's second chart here. You don't have it on yours, but we'll put it up here. What he is showing here, for whatever reason, the separation of verses 25 and 26 and 7, 
and actually 27 comes back to pick up that last week. This is what theologians call as the interval. From the time that Jesus came in on the triumphal entry, the time clock stopped for Israel. The time clock stopped for Israel. Now, some will tell you, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it couldn't really have stopped there. In God dealing on their behalf, it stopped there. By 70 AD, everything that Jesus prophesied, he said, this temple will be destroyed. There won't be one brick upon it. That happened in 70 AD. Everything Jesus prophesied came to pass. Jesus working on behalf of Israel stopped the 69 weeks there. The portion that I read to you in Daniel chapter 2 that he's going to set up this kingdom, the time clock starts again. Now, this is why I wanted you to know God's over time. For Israel, the time clock starts again when they sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist. That will start this 70th week that's in Daniel. So, we've been living in this interval time. What happened in the interval from God dealing with Israel being taken over by all these different uh, empires to when he came and he died and he rose again, what's been happening? It's called the church age. Welcome, church. It's your time. They, they call it as the days of the Gentile or the fullness of the Gentiles. That's us. That he came to save the whole world, not just Israel. So this interval time from the 69 weeks of the 70 weeks that Daniel's talking about, the 70th week doesn't start up time again for Israel until he signs, till Israel's leadership signs a peace treaty with the Antichrist. So that's why I wanted you to know that God is over time. And though within the time clock stopping for Israel, Something started for the rest of humanity, God's grace. It's there for Israel also, but many of them are blind to it because they did not see these other things come to pass. They did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because he did not overthrow the Roman Empire. He did not send, set up his earthly kingdom. They did not distinguish between his heavenly messages that there would be a first event of his coming and there would be a second event of his coming. They saw it all as one event, and because of that, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Now, in closing, the last verse, Amos. You go, where is Amos? It's up on the screen. <laughs> Amos 3.7. Surely, listen to that word. Isn't that really powerful? Surely, the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. This says to the prophet Amos that God is not hiding anything from his people. He's going to reveal, and he tells it beforehand so that you can know with confidence that he has once again did all those years, civilization after civilization, to the day his son declares himself as king riding in triumphantly on Palm Sunday. Isn't that amazing? To the day that you and I can know that nothing's going to come that will sneak up on God. And you and I can be assured that his word is true and he's sovereign over time itself. That's the God we serve. You needed to know all that for when people say, but this is the time and this is it. You go, well, wait a minute. I need to check with God's word here because obviously God is very, very specific. And if someone says this is, this is happening, Jesus actually foretold and said, many will say, come run here because the time has come. And he says, oh, that's not it. That's not the time. You're listening to people that think they know the time clock and the one that knows it is God. Let's pray. Father, I know there's a lot right here. For some, they're going, oh, my. Oh, my. I pray that we got this tonight. You are God, and there's none like you. There's none like you. 
we see you've gone to great lengths to give us an authentic, and thank you that I could even say that word, an authentic message, one that is so detailed, so structured, and has your fingerprint that all through the Bible, we see your hand. God, I pray for anybody that's here tonight or anybody that finds us by the website, that this softens the heart and says, I've been bringing God to a lower level. God is the creator of the universe. And he, you did it just the way you said. You saved us just the way you said. And you're coming for us just the way you say. I trust you in this, Lord. And I pray that hearts would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We receive this truth as God's word to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.